Hello, my name is Jeff Albert. I'm a wood sculptor and I'm recording this video from my home in North Carolina. This is my studio workshop behind me. Our dog Denver is sleeping on the ground over here. And above me in these old pine and maple trees, the cicadas are singing their hearts out. Today, I'm going to talk about inviting our art back into our lives and expanding how we use our art to enrich our lives, bring us joy, and maybe reach some new audiences. I hope you'll find it to be both helpful to your art and meaningful to your life. In this video, I'll show you some of my sculptures, share some of the ways I'm starting to use them, and the process that helped me to see these new possibilities. Then we'll explore ways for you to use your own process, to ask your own questions, and to explore your own unique ways of bringing your art back into your life. The cicadas are getting pretty loud out here, so I'm going to head into the house where it's a little less noisy. I hope you'll stay with me. You know, as artists, we're accustomed to putting our lives into our work. We know that the things that make us unique are as much a part of our art as our materials and our tools. Our interests, our personalities, our very lives are the things that make our art our art. But over time, we can become very product-oriented. Once our lives flow into our art, it's tempting to see the process as completed, captured in that uh, finished piece of art. What I want to talk about today is not so much reversing this flow of life into art, but letting it complete its natural cycle. It's about inviting our life through our art back into our life again. It's about rediscovering what we've always known, that our art and our life are part of this never-ending cycle and that we're much more fulfilled when we pay attention to the process of that, not just the product that comes out of it. As I share how this process is working out in my life and my art, I want to be very clear about something. I'm only using myself as an example. Your unique life produces your unique art, so your path, your art life cycle, will be just as unique. Like all of you, my work is an expression of who I am and what is so about my life. The natural world often inspires the external shapes that I use in my sculptures. But there are three other factors that influence the inward themes of my sculpture. First, there's a spiritual thread that flows through my life, so it naturally flows into my sculptures. I use the term spiritual in a very broad and expanded sense. For me, spiritual means connections. It's about making connections and becoming aware of a seemingly invisible oneness that's all around me. This includes a oneness with the natural world, a oneness with one another, and my experience of a divine presence. Secondly, I spent much of my adult life as a social worker, and I have witnessed the joys and the pains, the hurts and the healing of our human existence. It's quite natural that elements of the human condition show up in my work. And finally, writing has always been important to me, not so much for publication, at least not yet, but for myself. Writing helps me to process feelings, explore ideas, and see connections. Sometimes my thoughts can be as tangled as a pile of coat hangers on the floor, just a big mess. But through writing, I'm able to sort things out, to see things more clearly. And with the clutter gone, 
the creative process can flow more freely. Regarding writing, I am a huge fan of Julia Cameron's classic book, The Artist Way. And if you're not familiar with The Artist Way, I highly recommend it for every artist. The Artist Way is a wonderful resource for helping artists to unblock their creativity, to find their courage, and even to heal from what we could call artistic wounds. I especially benefit from what Julia Cameron calls morning pages. Morning pages are simply three longhand written pages, first thing in the morning, about anything and everything that's going on in your head or your life. And because the writing is for your eyes only, the spelling and grammar don't count. But for me, sometimes a new idea for a sculpture comes out of it. And it was through writing my morning pages that new ideas and new ways of expanding how I use my art began to emerge. Allow me to take a moment to share with you why it was that I wanted to expand the use of my art. First, the traditional process of making sculptures, trying to sell them online, in a gallery, or at an art show, was growing stale for me. To be sure, I still wanted and needed to pursue those things. They just didn't feel as life-giving as I wanted them to be. In other words, I had poured my life into my art. My art just wasn't bringing as much life or purpose back to me. And at the same time, I realized that there were many pieces of my sculpture that I just couldn't bring myself to release. They were too personal to me, and they had more life in them to me than just a one-time sale. I really wanted to share them with the world and even earn some income from them, but in a way that I could use them again and again. So what's a sculptor to do? Well, for me, the answer was to use writing to sort things out, to dream on paper, and to try to see expansion and connecting all of these dots. I want to talk a little bit about the process that I used to sort all of this out and to try to seek some answers. First, I ask myself the questions. What is my true purpose? What is my true work? And what else could I do with my art? Then I wrote about wanting to hold on to certain sculptures and why was it that I wanted to hold on to them. Finally, I acknowledged the three things that were important to me, the spiritual themes, the human condition, and reflective writing. And I wrote about these things. And I want to be clear and honest here. Answers didn't appear overnight. I wrote and I sat with the questions and I wrote some more and I sat with the questions some more. But slowly, over time, I began to see some ideas emerging out of this fog. I began to see that the sculptures I wanted to keep addressed themes like identity, story, mystery, healing, and beginnings. I saw that I had used all of these sculptures and their themes for my own self-reflection. And that made me wonder, if they were useful to me in this way, perhaps they could be meaningful to others as well. Connecting these dots and following these trails where they led, led me to where I am today. Currently, I'm developing self-reflection and contemplative writing workshops based on themes expressed in my sculptures. Workshops that I can adapt for specific groups like cancer patients, caregivers, spiritual communities. 
what I envision is bringing my sculptures to a class or a writing workshop, discussing the themes and providing open-ended writing prompts based on those themes for people to do their own inward exploring and reflection. Now I say envision because like a lot of things, COVID-19 hit the pause button on several opportunities I had in the works. So in the meantime, I'm back to exploring through writing again and asking questions of myself, but this time on how I might be able to shift to some virtual workshops or who knows, maybe a book. So a little scenery change here. Now I want to share some of my sculptures that have themes related to aspects of finding newness, our story, and sensing change. I'll spend the most time discussing the first one because what better way to start than with a sculpture titled Genesis. Genesis. The very name means beginning. I started this sculpture from a sketch I had drawn of an imaginary bone. I've loved bones since my childhood when I collected old animal bones I found in the woods near my home. Bones have never represented death to me. Instead, I see them as magnificent natural sculptures. As I carved this piece, it spoke to me in a language artists understand and said that they weren't old, dry, or brittle bones. They were vibrant living bones. They wanted to grow, start flowing, and express new life forming. They were living bones. That thought and that term reminded me of an old Neil Diamond song titled B, which includes the lyrics, while the sand would become the stone, which begat the spark, turned to living bone, holy, holy. So, I listened to the sculpture and changed the design. There at my workbench, this piece was immediately titled Genesis, and it became about beginning, or maybe beginning again. I help explore newness, beginning, and creating as part of my writing workshops. And of course, as artists, we are creators, always bringing newness into the world. And while some might see beginning as a distinct point in time, others, like myself, recognize that ideas and life itself are always changing, constantly beginning, emerging, and transforming. There's an interesting old philosophical question about a boat that gets its parts replaced one by one, and whether it's the same boat or a new boat, and at what point did it become a new boat? Something to ponder. And while transformations may be constant, there are certain stages that call for our attention. The writer Sue Monk Kidd wrote, I think there must be a place inside of us where dreams go and wait their turn. So how do we recognize when it's an idea's turn? Consider for a moment what words or images speak to you when something new is ready to take its turn. Here are a few suggestions. A window or a door. An ember a seed, pregnancy and birth, a whisper, an ache or a restlessness, an idea that just makes you smile. What other image or of emerging or transformation speaks to you? My sincere hope is that as you look for new ways to invite your art into your life, the signs of transformation will be clear, saying, it's my turn. Another piece I'm keeping for my writing workshop is called Night Wind. It's one of the first sculptures I created after I decided later in life that I too could be an artist. I had done some wood carving throughout my life, but I never really pursued it as art. Now, you might be thinking that 
Sculpting the wind is a little advanced for a beginning sculptor, but considering that since childhood I've had a friendship with the wind and even imagined I could see it, it really wasn't much of a stretch at all. I titled this piece Night Wind because of a song by Tracy Wickland called The Mountain Song. One of her verses says, I listened to the music of the night wind in the pines. I remembered back to my old college days when I spent a lot of time with myself, sometimes camping in the mountains of North Carolina and pondering spirituality, who I was, and how I wanted to be in this world. One evening, I camped in a pine forest and listened to the night wind blowing through those tall pine trees, and it was indeed magical music. It made me wonder, can something lull you to physical sleep and awaken your soul at the same time? I think it can. One of my favorite poems is Who Has Seen the Wind by Christina Rossetti. Who has seen the wind? Neither I nor you. But when the leaves hang trembling, the wind is passing through. Who has seen the wind? Neither you nor I. But when the trees bow down their heads, the wind is passing by. That poem and my sculpture, Night Wind, remind me to pay attention to the invisible signs of transformation, because even though I can't see it, something is present when the trees bow down their heads. This sculpture, titled Deep, is one of my many favorites. It obviously has an aquatic theme, and one could simply enjoy the piece in that way, but I think Deep has a lot more to say to us. Outwardly, it's about peering into the depths of water, trying to see just a little deeper than our eyes will allow. We see a flash or a movement under the water's surface, just out of sight, and immediately pay closer attention. A little voice in our head may even whisper, that's just your imagination. But we know, we know for certain that we saw something. Inwardly, Deep represents exploring yet unknown mysteries of life, relationships, spirituality, and the world around us. It's about sensing something deeper and truer is at work. And even though we can't see it, we pay closer attention because we don't want to miss it. As we think about expanding how we use our art and inviting more of our art into our life, if we pay close attention, maybe what we're looking for is just below the surface. Now, let's examine some specific ways that you might go about inviting more of your art to flow back into your life and expand how you use it. As artists, we're already masters at figuring things out, seeing wonderful possibilities in raw materials and connecting invisible dots. Artists don't just think outside the box, they completely deconstruct the box to make something new. I couldn't begin to tell you exactly how to expand the way you use your unique art in your own unique life, and I don't think that you would want me to. The process I used and where it took me were unique to me. What I hope to do is encourage you to discover, or more accurately, rediscover things you already know. I will offer a few things for you to consider. First, use the way that you best process ideas. Here are a few suggestions to consider. Writing. As you know, writing is what works for me. And science tells us that there are some universal benefits to processing ideas and feelings through writing. It's tactile, it engages our senses, and stimulates our brains in wonderful ways. So I encourage you to make writing at least a part of your process. Some people do their best thinking through intentional drawing or doodling. For others, 
just sitting quietly and pondering or meditating works for them. And sometimes the best ideas come while we're doing other things. Research shows that walking is especially beneficial to thinking, but other activities may work for you, like doing routine chores, listening to music, and of course, sculpting. Some people process better when they're discussing ideas with other people. And of course, your way may be totally different from these. Also, consider using more than one way. While writing is the primary way I process, walking and discussing with others are also very helpful to me. Step two is to be intentional. Every day, intentionally invite your art back into your life. Say it to yourself, write it, or post it where you will see it every day. Use whatever phrases feel natural to you. Here are some suggestions. I want to invite more of my art into my life. I am welcoming my art back into my life. And my art is flowing back to me. And don't forget, celebrate any small returns that you see. Step three is to specifically name the areas of your life that flow into your art and whether your art brings life back to any of those areas. Step four is where the real work begins. After you identify how you process, have set your intention, and name the parts of your life that flow into your art, it's time to ask and live with some questions. I recommend that you write out these three questions to start. What is my true work and purpose? What else could I do with my art? And where does my art life cycle feel stale and no longer feels life-giving? Of course, add your own questions. Here are just a few other suggestions to consider as you process all of this. Look for connections that you see. Think about how you want to be, not just what you want to do. And give it some time. Our minds are wonderful machines that can work in the background if we are intentional and attentive. As the late baseball legend Yogi Berra said, you can observe a lot just by watching. If you have any questions about the video, send me an email to the address in the closing slides. And especially if anything I said was helpful to you or you want to share how you use this video in your own art and life, I would love to hear from you. Again, my email address will be in the closing frames. I am deeply grateful to you for watching this video. I'm Jeff Albert, and as always, peace and joy.